It's getting so that I need to tell someone about this. I'm posting it here to limit my liability. I mean, it makes sense, right? I'm just telling a story. So you can believe what you want. I know what I know to be true. And that's good enough for me. Actually, that's not really true. I don't know what's true or what I believe anymore. I just know that I haven't been able to sleep for a few weeks now. I work for a small consulting firm hired for project management on the Edmonton AB Valley Line LRT construction. I was happy when our company was awarded the contract, but with what I know, I wouldn't accept any amount of money in the world to do this job now. I should give you a little background. I'm a third generation Edmontonian. My grandfather originally moved here from St. Paul as a child in the 30s. My dad owned a successful development company. And when I graduated from the U of A, I took over the project management wing. Again, we were a small in-house company. It's when we were tapped by the city of Edmonton to undertake the very large infrastructure project that was expanding transit, we were ecstatic. I should also note that as a lifelong Edmontonian, with roots going back here in this city, I know that thing is not supposed to be there. Everyone knows it's not supposed to be there. March 15th is when most people found out about it. A concrete mass the size of a car under the riverbed in the path of the Tawadana Bridge that is being constructed. Our press release would simply focus on any future traffic delays based on having to prolong our operation. Hundreds of thousands of people hearing the news and going, Hmm, well that's interesting. They're all assuming that finding random things underground is normal when you're excavating to build a bridge. They're assuming we have all that under control. But what if it was different? If we uncovered a mass grave? Would it make people wonder what it was doing there? What if we uncovered an unexploded bomb? Or a dinosaur skeleton? Or a treasure trove of ancient artifacts? What would it take for people to look up from their Tim Hortons and ask, What's that doing there? It was actually the 12th of March we found the thing. It took us almost a week until we decided to let on to the general public what we had found. And even then, we didn't say much about it. Monday, March 12th, 2018. It was Monday morning. I dropped my kids off at daycare and was merging onto the Henday Freeway from Sherwood Park when I got a call from Bill, who was on the dig site. Pete, I need you on site. I could sense panic in his voice. I was concerned there'd been a workplace accident. I was just heading to my office. What's up? I told Bill, speaking louder than usual so that my voice would be picked up by the Bluetooth in my truck. I don't know how to explain this. I'll just have to show you when you get here. He paused for a second. Get here quick, he added, before hanging up. I felt a sharp flash of pain in my bowels. Since I had taken on this project, I had been experiencing it more and more. I rushed to the side and jumped out of my truck, meeting Bill in the staging area. What? What is it? I pleaded when I walked up to him. He was with some of the agents from the company that we had hired to do the cofferdam work. They were poring over reports and drafts. I don't know how to explain this, but we found something in the riverbed. He shrugged and started leading me toward the bank. Uh, okay. What? I thought. I thought he was going to say it was a body. That's all we needed. Some sort of murder investigation to tie us up. I mean, it would be sad for the victim and everything. But all the companies involved would have to pay a penalty if the completion deadline was extended. It's a body, isn't it? Fuck, I knew it. 
I ran my hand down the side of my face. No, it's not a body. It's a big slab of concrete. He shrugged again. I looked out over the water and back at him. I don't see it, I said dumbly. It's in the riverbed right where we're supposed to be constructing one of the supports. He put his hands on his hips. This was worse news than if it was a body. It was sure to delay construction. Can we take it out? I said, hoping that the simple solution would be all that was required to rectify the situation. No, no, we can't take it out. It's too big. It'll mess with the coffer damming and it's below the actual riverbed itself. So if we pull it, it'll create a sinkhole. He began walking again, and I followed him into his office in a run-down modular trailer. How long is this going to take us extra? I moaned. Well, we can incorporate it into the structure. That'd be the easiest solution. He pulled out some papers and thrust them in my direction. Great, let's do that then. I smiled, shit-eating grin and everything. There's something else, though. Okay. I hated how cryptic he was being. At this point, I just wanted to cut to the chase and tell me how much it was going to cost and how much more work I'd have to do because of it. It's not on any of the geotechnical reports. It's not on any technical drawings. I consulted with her engineers, and they say it's not even on historical drawings. No one remembers anything ever being there. He motioned at the papers I was holding. I rifled through them. Huh, you're right. I placed the papers back on his desk. And that was my reaction. And that's why I say, what would it take for you to have heard this story more than in passing? More than just that five or so seconds, you think, oh, well, that's odd. That's what I thought. It was odd. Nothing more, nothing less. I didn't question why there was a block of concrete under the North Saskatchewan riverbed. A man-made block of concrete that wasn't on any technical drawing, that wasn't in any history books. The river that had estimated begun flowing through this area 2,500 years ago. A river that carried countless indigenous people over the centuries. That explorers first sailed down in 1760. That the original ford was constructed next to in 1795. That hosted a town, and then a city thereafter. A river that never had anything built where a concrete block the size of a car was now under the riverbed. That none of the people in history that I just mentioned ever noticed. A man-made, giant concrete block under the river where nothing had ever existed before. I didn't question how it got there. I was just thinking of how much money and time we needed to spend on it. It wasn't until Bill said the next thing that I questioned it. It's making a sound, he suggested. What is? I thought he was talking about his laptop, which he was turning toward me. The big block. It makes a sound. He opened up a file from his email. We had some industrial divers down to survey it. Shit got weird. He kind of chuckled, but that didn't hide the pensive look on his face. Immediately, they came back up. They both complained they were really nauseous. Now maybe they were sick. But they both felt better when they got back up, so they thought maybe something was wrong with their equipment. They checked everything, and everything was okay. So they went down there again, and it happened again. So they pushed through, set the equipment, and then we got some recordings. 
He stopped while he fumbled with his mouse, trying to click open the file he wanted to show me that he was taking a very long time to open. Well, okay, I'll show you this in a sec. He winced at the slow machine, and then began again. Anyway, so... So the thing... We get these readings back, and... Bill was trying to explain, but he couldn't quite describe it. He was somewhat frantic, and kept stopping to look at the ceiling. The thing makes a sound. Not like sound, but a vibration. Infrasound, one of our engineers called it. Like a very low, like 7 hertz, like a vibration kind of thing. He turned back to his computer, cursing it out. I should say it is not uncommon in construction and engineering for stationary objects to vibrate at some sort of frequency. In fact, the example I can tell you about without getting into too much technical detail would be the example of a suspension bridge that begins to undulate in a wave. And of course, any sort of vibration like that would create a sound. And sometimes these vibrations create larger and larger vibration. Constructive interference that eventually destroys whatever is doing the humming. But a concrete block by itself normally doesn't do this. So while it was odd, it was still inside the realm of possibility for me. So, I didn't know where he was going with this. I was a little taken aback, but I wasn't still completely convinced the problem was worth more than considering just the amount of money and time to fix it. So, Bill started but was interrupted by an extremely loud noise. His computer had started playing the sound file he was trying to open, and it caused an intensely loud low distortion to come through his speakers, which were full volume. I clutched my ears, and then my stomach as it began to instantly hurt. He clicked furiously to turn it off. That's the noise? I yelled over the buzzing. He kept clicking to close the file, but it wouldn't close. I can't... He fumbled around desperately. I instinctively reached for the connection for the speakers and violently yanked it out. We were both standing there, panting, nauseous. Bill looked embarrassed. We both sat back down and exhaled deeply. I still didn't know what to say about it. We both sat in uncomfortable silence. I was waiting for him to tell me more, but I realized he didn't know any more than I did. And I was the project manager. He was expecting me to have an answer or a solution. Um, I began, not really knowing what I was going to say. But I had to say something. So the engineers can't take it out, I confirmed. He nodded slowly. It's, uh, loud? I wasn't getting anywhere. Bill began to shuffle the papers on its desk into a neat pile. Did the structural engineers say anything? I said, looking out the window. It had been a foggy morning. But the sun was peeking out, a grayish-yellow hue settling over the river valley. They're doing a report on it, Bill kind of mumbled. I began to rise from my chair, eager to get out of the trailer and back to the safety of my office. I thought, maybe, the answer would come to me. Or maybe it'd resolve itself. Or maybe the engineers would come back and say it was no more difficult than extracting a tooth. And maybe they would say the humming was some natural phenomenon. And maybe they'd say the concrete got there from some mistake when they were originally putting up the clover bar footbridge that we had demolished to make way for our construction. Maybe it wasn't that there was a man-made concrete block under the riverbed that had no history 
and was making a noise. Tuesday, March 13th, 2018. The next morning, I lifted myself out of bed at the sound of my alarm, morose and heavier than the sum of my parts. I dragged myself around the kitchen as if I was a marionette hanging from strings while I fed the kids and got them ready for daycare. I hadn't slept well. I kept worrying about the block, the practical items, the cost, the time, the liability. Then, the impractical. What was it doing there? Why was it making a sound? Then I had fallen asleep only an hour or two before my alarm was to go off. Dreaming, I was standing on the riverbank while black clouds covered the sky. In the river, I could see a light. It was the block, glowing an intense gray light like sun through clouds on a bleak day. And the hum it was emitting was pulling me toward it like a magnet. I walked into the water, and I could breathe underwater. And the cube pulled me towards it, and I became part of it. And when I was part of the cube, I was a part of the earth. And there was an intense sadness in this image of emaciated people all in perfectly formed lines, wearing what looked like gas masks, but otherwise naked. And they were... I don't know how to put this. You know in a dream when you just know something to be true? They were all facing an imminent death, and it wasn't a comforting release, move on to the afterlife type thing. It was a violent death, and there was this intense fear everyone was feeling. I drove in a haze, on autopilot. One of those drives where you're a little shaken when you get to where you're going. Because when you get there, you can't remember any details about how you drove there. What if you mowed someone down? I walked back toward the bank, donning my hard hat, to Bill, who was again speaking to a group of planners, and pointing out something to them in the drafts. He let them go, and then he had me follow him into his office again. I called you six times. He said, frowning. I looked at my phone. There was indeed six missed calls. I somehow didn't hear over the course of my night hours. Oh shit, I'm sorry. I began apologizing profusely. He waved it off with his hand and started. So, we got the engineering report back. They're trying to say maybe there's something wrong with the equipment or it's background interference, or one of the machines operating in the vicinity caused it, or whatever, Bill said, creating a space through his closed Venetian blinds and peeking out toward the river. But you don't believe that, I said slowly, trying to read him. It's getting louder, Bill said. I snorted by accident. What do you mean it's getting louder? I tried to sound as serious as I could. I began to think this was some sort of very early April Fool's joke. It's louder. I can hear it. I couldn't hear it before. Then yesterday evening, at about 7pm, I was in here working on some things, and I swear I could hear it. He resumed peeking suspiciously through his blinds. I felt like either this was a big joke, or he was losing it. Bill, you know, you've been working pretty hard. I started. He snapped back quickly and curtly before I could finish my sentence. I know I can hear it. This fucking thing. Whatever it is. He turned back to the window again. I was worrying now about Bill. I had worked several projects with Bill. He 
between our respective companies. I had met his wife and his children. We had times where we saw each other more than we saw our own families. I had never known him to be this way, but I was wondering if perhaps I didn't know him as much as I thought I did. What do you think it is? I said slowly. Bill sort of snapped out of it. He turned back towards me and slumped down at his desk. I don't know, he sort of mumbled. He paused for a bit and then changed gears, suddenly springing up. Anyway, the engineers say they can incorporate it at a minimal additional cost, but we're going to have to talk to the city because it's going to take longer, we'll miss our opening date. He looked forlorn. We both knew that was money out of our pockets. Big money. Suddenly, the intangibles of the mysterious cube were no longer at the forefront, and the day-to-day -day of paying bills and putting food on the table was. I'll talk to them, I said in a reassuring tone. No one knew this was going to happen, so maybe we can escape penalty. I nodded and patted him on the back. He continued to stare at his desk. That night, once again, I dreamed of the cube. This time I was on the North River Bank. It was nighttime in the summer. The air was a void. One of those days where there is no wind, and the temperature and humidity are just so that you feel you're in absence of an atmosphere. Everything is hushed, and you don't feel your arm moving through the air. All the leaves are still, and the blades of grass don't move with any breeze. The air doesn't feel cool entering your nostrils. There are no smells of hot pavement from the day or taste of sweet dew weeping from the trees. Just nothing. The reflections of lights from the building downtown. The campus and high-rise towers of Saskatchewan Drive reflecting in the still water. That's wrong, though. The river is never still. When you stand next to it, you realize it's not the shallow and tranquil picture you see in your car window, driving alongside of it. It's raging, fast-moving, white-tipped, and churning. It's not a pencil line drawn on a map, but a deep expanse cutting the city in half, impossibly wide. But in the dream, I could just walk up to it. The banks were soft and sandy, like that of a still lake under the moon, and I walked into the middle of the river. It was only an inch deep, and the riverbed was asphalt. And out of the river rose the cube, like a monolith. Like the monolith on the album cover of Who's Next. So I disrobed, and I was going to piss on the cube, like the who pissed on the monolith. But a door opened in it. So I went in. And inside, it was like being in an ice rink. It was cold and white and artificial, and the only thing that wasn't white was a really small piece of writing in the corner of one of the walls. It looked like it was right next to me, but I walked for hours, and when I got to it, it just said, What now? Wednesday, March 14th, 2018. I awoke to the sound of my phone ringing in the kitchen. I rushed down the stairs to answer it. Hello? I started. I mean, Pete speaking. I started again. It was Farage. He was one of Bill's structural engineers. You've got an emergency on site, and we'll need you there right away. He said seriously and deliberately. The roads were empty, as it was still very early in the morning. It was still dark, too early even to have anything broadcasted on the radio. 
The news day hadn't started yet. Maybe whatever happened, there was still time for it to not get blown out of proportion. I sped to the contractor lot. Raj looked like his even self. Perfectly pressed checkered blue shirt and gray slacks. Polished shoes. You certainly wouldn't know he had been sprung awake at three in the morning. The police had phoned him. On site, there were two unmarked police cars. Shit, what is it? I exclaimed, my head on a swivel. It's Bill, he said, still keeping an even pace. Something happened with him, he replied. I thought he was going to say more. Clearly, there was much more to be said. He led me toward the trailer. I opened the door and immediately stepped forth into blood. Raj began to fill me in again. What the policeman had said, he explained. Bill went outside, in one of the securities, they had seen him covered in blood. He was screaming and ran towards the river. He pointed. I looked at him and nodded, hoping he would reveal more. He had said, the policeman had said, that he had cut himself. But I guess security just grabbed him before he could go in the water. He probably wouldn't have been able to swim in there. He checked his phone. I'm going to go now and come back later in the day when I have some meetings. He holstered his phone. The policemen want to talk to you, and you can just take over the situation. I agreed and let the weary man go home. I sat down at Bill's desk and began to send emails. I wanted to go to Bill and find out how he was doing. Hell, just find out what he was doing. My professional responsibility came first. Emails to everyone in public relations and human resources in terms of not releasing statements to the media. Emails to Bill's colleagues about who's going to liaise with me regarding our responsibilities together. Emails to the company that had the proper PPE to clean up blood. Workers were already arriving on site in the morning. Randall came in. It was second to Bill to take his place. I told him he'd have to work in a different room. The essence of Bill was still all over the floor. Finally, at quarter after nine, I was able to sneak out to drive to the hospital. Bill was bandaged behind a curtain and sedated. I walked in and he closed his eyes tight. He wouldn't look at me perhaps ashamed. I sat down next to his hospital bed without saying a word. It wouldn't stop. His voice cracked. It kept showing me things. He breathed deeply and sighed. He began again. It kept showing me everyone was going to die. It wanted me to do it. He coughed. Wait, Bill, what was it showing you? I became alarmed. I don't know, man, just death. Just everyone die. I can't explain it. I saw people. I didn't see them dying, but I knew they were dying. I knew they were going to die. He gasped. I was reminded of my dream from the other night. Bill, what do you mean it wanted you to do it? I grabbed his arm. I began to squeeze a little too intensely. He pulled away from me. I don't know. I don't know. I just felt like he was pulling me toward it. And I don't know. I just knew. I knew if I went in there, it would cause everyone dying. And I couldn't stop myself. 
I tried to stop myself. I thought if I ended it, then I couldn't do it. But it stopped me. And it pulled me. And I had to go. He began weeping. I felt my face burning. I felt butterflies as if I had driven over a dip at speed. A horrible sinking feeling that something was terribly wrong that was much larger than me, or the crew, or the city, or anyone in the world. Bill grabbed my shirt cuff. Tell me I'm not crazy, he wept. I, uh, what did I say? He was? I was? We both were? Or much more terrifyingly, neither of us were. And there was a cube under the river that was leading us to our destruction. I gotta go, Bill. I darted out of the hospital room. When I arrived back at the site, the restoration crew had just finished cleaning Bill's office. I sat down at his desk. I thumbed through the geotechnical reports again and the reports from the structural engineers. I stumbled upon the report from the industrial divers. There were some ultrasonic pictures of the mass included. Something in one of them caught my eye. In the photos of the cube itself, there appeared to be something etched. A small group of words. At first, I thought it was a watermark on the side, but I looked closer. I held it under light. It said, What now? I dropped the picture. I must be mistaken. Or maybe I had seen the photo before, and that's why I dreamed what I did. That must have been it. Something interrupted my train of thought. A buzzing from one of the machines outside. I rose and stepped out of the trailer and crossed the yard. I climbed to the cab of one of the pieces of excavation equipment that was working. I told the driver to shut it down, but I still heard the buzzing. I grabbed one of the foremen on site. Do we have any other machines running? I yelled to him. Just a few generators. He shrugged. Shut them down. Now. I ordered. Why? What's going on? He inquired, concerned. Nothing. I just need all machines stopped for a minute. I yelled back again, and began wandering around the lot trying to find the source of the noise. All machines were off. Still, I could hear the buzzing. It was coming from the river. It was coming from the cube. I walked back over to the foreman. Do you hear that? I yelled. He shrugged. I ran back into the office and closed the door. It was getting louder, but not for everyone. I didn't want to meet the same fate as Bill, so I let the crews resume work and promptly left to go home early, faking illness. That night, I tried to stay up indefinitely. I didn't want to dream of the cube. I left my bedroom and crept into the living room. All was silent. I sat sipping coffee on the couch. I tried to surf the internet to keep myself awake. I fell asleep. I dreamed I was in the desert. I was walking, not knowing where I was going, not knowing where I was. I stopped, and as I looked down, I noticed something. It was a tiny cube, a tiny cube of concrete. I held it in my hand, and it was smooth and cool. Suddenly, 
it started to grow. Buildings rose up around me. Cities, landscapes. The cue became too heavy, and I dropped it. I was standing in a small stream. The stream began to grow with the cube, as the cube was sinking in the stream. Then it was too heavy, and sunk to the bottom. The river and the city continued to grow, the cube growing heavier, and then sinking down below the riverbed. I was somewhere floating above it all, and I felt this great misery that I had dropped the cube. I felt like I was supposed to hold on to it. I felt like a failure. I realized I was every person on earth, and I had failed this thing by dropping it. The cube, which I could somehow see below ground, turned red, and he was angry. I came to know as you do in dreams, that if I had killed myself, if I had killed humanity, it would be satisfied again, and the cities would go away, and it would just be a small cube in the desert again. I wouldn't do it, so it became angry at me, and it hummed louder and louder until I woke up to my alarm. Thursday, March 15th, 2018. I drove to the work site and began preparations for the media. All we were telling them was that there'd be more traffic delays. Of course, because that's all people care about. Not where the fucking cube came from, or why it's there, or the fact that it's humming and wants to destroy us all. Just the fact that the bridge will take longer, and it will mean more traffic delays. The public went, hmm, that's interesting, and they moved on. I went into the office. Farage came in behind me. He was briefing me on the updates. His usual even tenor was off. His usually perfectly stiff shirt was wrinkled. He was sweating, and he had bags under his eyes. So they'll start work to incorporate it into the bridge structure. He spoke quietly. Farage? I looked into his eyes. Can you hear that? He nodded. And the industrial divers, and some more of the crew. And it's getting louder, he added. When we build it into the bridge, will that stop? I asked him hopefully. I don't know, he said with force. And that's where we are today. We're building a cube into the bridge. Like it's nothing. Like it doesn't make a sound. Like it doesn't take over our dreams and our actions. And that it doesn't have some sort of hell-bent will to get rid of us. We're going to just build a bridge on top of it. And hope that eventually, anyone near it, anyone who crosses the bridge, anyone in the city, the country, the world doesn't hear it humming. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments below, and tell me what you thought of this narration. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you'd like to get early videos, shoutouts, and much, much more, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. 
It's a place where you can help support my channel while getting awesome rewards in the process, and every pledge helps out a ton, no matter the size. So if you'd like to see all the rewards I offer and consider becoming a patron, it'd mean a ton to me if you'd click the link in the description and just check it out. And don't forget to show some love to the amazingly talented authors who make these narrations possible. Have a good night, everybody. Cheers.